Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so this is uh, a, a brief introduction to Rust for C++ programmers. I, I stumbled over Rust a few years back, uh, and uh, I'm a long C++ programmer. I've been programming C and C++ since they were standard, so um, it's been in my toolbox for a long time. Uh, but I stumbled over this, and as part of this, I actually thought it could be a good idea to sort of uh, introduce Rust to people knowledgeable about C++, and also try to explain what thing or what area it is Rust tries to solve. And in that, we are going to compare it with C++, but the intention is not to sort of bash C++. It's just to make a comparison and try to outline what Rust tries to actually solve in this context. So, uh, brief introduction. Who am I? I'm a technical team lead at Timescale. Uh, we develop time series databases. I'm not going to discuss that here because this is about C++ and Rust, so I'm not going to delve into that. If you're interested, uh, you can talk to me after the presentation. Uh, previously, I have worked with compilers. I worked with compilers seven years at IAR Systems um, between roughly 1996 and 2004 or something like that. I joined MySQL 2004 and went through the acquisition uh, when we got bought up by Sun and then by Oracle. So that was a very interesting journey. I hope somebody get the chance to do that. It was amazing in many ways. Uh, I've also been working with uh, real-time media. So basically backend, propagating media, uh, video media over backends uh, here as well. I'm a long time C++ programmer. I had a, as a hobby when I was younger to pick up new languages and see what they did and what they did good and what they did bad. I've been um, learning more languages than I can count, but some languages have stuck with me for a long time, and C and C++ are some of those. I started programming C++ 1988, I think, and C a few years ahead of that. I, I had a friend actually introducing C++ as a new language. It's like C, but it has classes. So that was quite interesting. Uh, but I, I loved it from the start, and I also uh, I love C as well. I'm programming C now at Timescale. So, uh, what is Rust? Rust is intended to be a language, uh, a system programming language, focused on running blazingly fast. So it's highly optimized. It also is supposed to prevent seg faults. This is something that most programmers encounter when you program C or C++. And it should also guarantee three thread safety. So it has a threading model that is supposed to be safe. Uh, the guiding principles are safe by default. So it, there are essentially no undefined behavior. It does not require a runtime. This is not entirely true, but this is what they pitch. And it's also supposed to bring you memory safety without using a garbage collector. Most languages that has memory safety has some sort of garbage collector, Java, Go, R2, Rust doesn't. So the language features, the first one is a very um, well-defined ownership system. So we will go over this briefly in, in the rest of the presentation, uh, but that is one of the key features for Rust. The other thing is it has a very powerful type system. As I mentioned, I've learned a number of languages before. Scheme and Haskell are some of those. Uh, and this type system reminds quite a lot of the type system of Haskell. It's very similar in many ways. Uh, it has also picked up a few other features, namely hygienic macros, if people are familiar with that. It comes from Scheme, Scheme R6, if I remember correctly, uh, which is a way to generate macros that don't have these problems with symbols being uh, introduced that are not, well, macros can be a mess, so uh, this solves this. Uh, you also have parameterized types and traits, which is sort of a replacement for classes in, uh, in comparison to C++. It has support for asynchronous programming, uh, so you can have um, various ways of uh, having an engine that has several threads being driven by uh, several 
threads. So we have a runtime that actually can, can juggle many things at the same time. This is mostly of interest when you have an I.O. bound uh, system. So in those cases, you usually wait a long time. You have a, a, a thread wa waiting for I.O. In the meantime, you can have uh, the CPU doing something else. And there are asynchronous models for this. Uh, and it is well defined in the language. It has, as I mentioned, a powerful macro system. I won't cover it here, but it's, uh, it's something that can offer both uh, significantly simpler models for programming as well as good performance. So it's well worth to study. And you also have an FFI, a forum function interface, to be able to interface with C and similar things. This is necessary because one of the focus areas is actually embedded systems. And that's also part of the reason why they didn't pick a, or they wanted to avoid having a big runtime. So C is sort of pitched as not having a runtime. Rust is pitched as not having a runtime in a similar way. It's not entirely true, but it's trying to become as, as small a runtime as possible. <coughs> The history. So this started in 2006 by Graydon Hoare. He worked at Mozilla at this time. It was just an idea, something he sort of played around with. Uh, after a while, Mozilla realized that they had problems with their, their uh, systems and they needed something better. So they got involved and started adopting this language as a, an alternative to, to C, actually. And the first stable release was released in May 2015. And we had a transition to a more modern version of Rust in December 2018. And right now we're roughly at uh, release 156. So it's advancing quite fast. It is efficient. This is a comparison. I, I, of course, I've picked the best examples. So there are a lot of other things. This is the uh, uh, benchmark game, if you're familiar with that. So it has a number of different benchmarks. It's, it's a few simple examples. I've picked the best ones, I have to admit that. Uh, but as you can see, uh, when you compare Rust with C and C++, <coughs> they are on par. Sometimes Rust is a little faster, sometimes Rust is, is a little slower, but C, C++ and Rust are roughly at the same level when it comes to execution. And then we have the other category, Go and Java are quite similar in execution time in these cases. And this is what people usually expect, so it, it shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, the tooling we have is not, it's, it's somewhat limited, not right now, but there are a few good things. There is a project manager called Cargo. Uh, there is Rust code formatting and other similar tools that help you with this. So you have Clippy, you have Rust formatter for this. And you also have a Rust language server that can index your code. So you usually can jump, jump around among the code and, and figure out where things are, where you have definitions, where you have declarations and similar things. Uh, <coughs> Rust library support it's, um, exists. It has a very large body of libraries, uh, roughly 67,000 last time I looked. Uh, it grows all the time. It's called uh, Cargo. Uh, it's called um, uh, Crates, crates.io. Some notable examples are Serde, which is done for serialization and deserialization, mainly to when you want to send things over the network. You have Dysel, which integrates with databases, so you can have an ORM layer. You have Tokyo, which is the biggest library right now to use the asynchronous model for programming, and it's, it's an event-driven platform. Uh, it's quite efficient, actually. And then you have Hyper and Rocket, which are intended for HTTP. So this is um, a few examples, but there is a lot more. Hyper is a server? Sorry? Hyper is a server? No, uh, it's not. It's actually a library that knows HTTP. HTTP. HTTP protocol. Yes. So uh, Rocket, for instance, that's a web framework uh -huh. where you can build servers. It uses Hyper uh, for that. So where Rust shines, these are my, my ideas of where Rust shines. First of all, it's safe by default. So when you write a program, when you get it to compile, it usually works. And that's actually quite amazing. Uh, the ownership model, which keeps track of where you lose, where you own stuff and where you don't own stuff, and complains when you are 
uh, leaving things without actually uh, being allowed to do that. It's um, very picky, that's one thing, but it's actually one of the reasons to why when you, once you make it pass, it actually works. It has a powerful type system. As I said, it's similar to Haskell, which is a functional language. It's, um, it's amazingly powerful. I, I, um, I basically love it. So I would like to see something like this in all languages. Concurrency without fear is something they pitch, and that is because when you are dealing with concurrency, then you have the problem with sharing objects, and this is controlled through the type system. So you can't by mistake share things that aren't supposed to be shared. You can't by mistake forget to add a mutex or have data that is not protected by a mutex. It's, it's in the design of the library. And it uses the type system to make this possible. It has no runtime. It's sort of not entirely true, but it's a very small runtime. Uh, so this is one of the features, especially since you're focusing on embedded systems. Governance, it's open source license, MIT. Release train model is a six week cycle. Nightly is built every night, you can test it and people do. Uh, you pick a beta every six weeks and you test that more thoroughly. And then after that, you cut a stable from the beta, assuming everything is fine. And then you have a new version. This is why it's constantly improving all the time. So you fix bugs, you add features and uh, you do a lot of other things as well. It has a very transparent language development model. It has a, a bunch of RFC. So if you have an idea, you propose an RFC. This is de debated publicly. And uh, usually a, 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 uh, an agreement is reached on how it's supposed to work. Every year, the Rust uh, governance actually picks a project plan, a roadmap for the year by taking the, the RFCs that seems to be most mature and build a roadmap for the year. And then people work on that one. So it actually works quite well. So uh, this was a brief introduction. So do you have any questions about these introductory parts? Well, uh, the yeah. crates. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I read that they're like very high quality, but is there anything, are all of them, is there anything to ensure the quality or can anyone make a crate? Anyone can make a crate. There's actually, uh, some squatting in the uh, environment as well. People that pick library names add some basic implementation and don't evolve it. So that happens as well. Uh, those that are popular are high quality usually. But it's, it's I mean, it's 67,000 crates. Anybody can create one. There is no limitations. But people are actually uh, uh, usually investing time in making them good. And, but there are a few that are sort of left behind and in some cases people are not maintaining things so that's that's quite common as well you had a question yeah is it uh, some coherent language specification or is it just RFCs um, there is a language specification I'm not sure what you mean it's not it's not that detailed as C++ standard is but it, there is a language specification yeah yeah, so it helps. So it's like uh, Java, more or less. It's one entity. Yeah. I will just know what that is. There are some people working on an alternate implementation. Okay. But it's not finished yet. The one based on GCC. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that actually. So I'm I'm not keeping tabs on that. So. Okay. So do you, did you have a question? Uh, <coughs> I saw the no runtime, and you said it yeah. as well. Uh, could you please elaborate it? No runtime or yeah, no runtime. What's the meaning of it? Uh, is, is it like C++ plus plus no runtime or time? C no runtime? It's more like C no runtime. <coughs> so it, you don't. If you run a very basic program, in in some cases you actually need some basic machinery to actually be able to run the library, run the entire program. Uh, memory allocation is one thing. Um, a few other things as well. And uh, in many cases, some languages have a very heavy runtime. Java, for instance, it has garbage collection is necessary. And there are a few other things that are needed that are not part of the library. And Rust aims to avoid these runtime, these basic necessities that you need to actually start and run the program. Uh, 
C has a similar model. It has a very small runtime. I think there are a few things that are actually necessary, but it's not much. C++ is a little larger, but it still has a few things that you actually need, whatever you do. I think, uh, uh, thank you. Okay. What's the example of uh, things that the Rust runtime does? Um, sorry, I, I don't know. But it's there. It's, it, it's there. Oh. It's it's something small. But it's yeah. very light, like, like yeah. C compared to C. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? I think Gano is basically the main thing with the task that C doesn't is stack unbinding. Mm -hmm. So it's like when like it panics the Rust code, you can get the stack trace. Uh yeah, that's true. Um yeah, that C makes sense. Happen. No, that's true. So you can actually get a stack trace if it panics, yes. I guess that could be part of the runtime. Yes? Um, when you look at the timing benchmarks between yeah. C++ and C and Rust, um, how much in the differences can you attribute to language design versus uh, compiler optimizations? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the actual implementation. So I, I can't really... Uh, I, I, there are advantages to Rust, but I don't think the Rust language in itself makes things faster. It's just that the compiler is very good. It has a very a, powerful a time system. Because if you have a, a much stricter time system, the, the compiler can, can assume things that the C++ yes. compiler cannot assume. So yes, it can. Rust that is true. Actually really use that because mm -hmm. it, it can't be fair that there is all these rules. They can do like. Uh, like yeah, like C++ cannot assume that two pointers. Yeah, but the Rust could be, yeah. but there are bugs in LLVM, so they can't use that optimization. Mm -hmm. They have enabled it just now, mm -hmm. and they are just waiting for a new bug to be discovered in LLVM. Yeah, so everything in Rust is currently built on LLVM, so which is the CLang framework. So, uh, but there is a GCC version uh, apparently ongoing. So. So let's focus a little more on Rust, actually. This was a brief introduction on, on uh, what surrounds Rust, but let's go and look at a few examples of problems in C and how Rust intend to solve them, or, or how a Rust attempt to solve them. So the first one is actually implicit conversions. So if you look at this example, then we have a, a, an a, cos a cosine minus one. It's supposed to return pi and a uh, a cos, arc cos, actually returns a double. But since it's implicitly converted to a float, you get a rounding error. And this is pretty close to pi, but it's not particularly close. Would you discover this is a problem? I don't think so. I, I, I couldn't see that at first. 96 or 92? Sorry? Is it 96 versus 92? I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> But it's so close that you, you don't see it immediately. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty close. And, and I mean, in, in most cases, you actually have warnings for this. So if you try to do an implicit conversion, if you have a double to a float, or if you have an, uh, an int to, uh, or a long to an int, or something like that, you can enable warnings. And you can turn this on in, in uh, GCC, for example. I usually use that, and I use dash w error as well to make sure that I don't have warnings. But usually when I arrive to a new code body, I have a bunch of warnings. People have loads of warnings, and they ignore them. So the question is, have you enabled this in your build? Do you compile with warnings? Do you think warnings are OK or not? I, if you think warnings are OK, and if you have languages where or implementations where you accept warnings, then you might not discover this problem. <coughs> if you do something similar in Rust, and this is Rust, then you get, a, get an error. So it says basically, OK, I'm trying to de declare a variable here that is f32, a floating bit 32. It says that a cosine, that version of it returns a float 64. That's not allowed. You're trying to make a conversion that could lose data. Not allowed. So it gives a warning, gives an error, sorry, and don't compile. And this is the first example of a Rust program. As you can, as you can see, it's quite similar to, to C. So how do you do it if you want to, 
quantity You can do an explicit conversion. So you can type as F32. So there are costs, but you have to be explicit about it. And we should talk about uniform initialization in C++. Uniform initialization in curly braces. Ah, it forbids yeah. narrowing. Sorry? It forbids narrowing. Ah, okay. That's, uh, that's a good use. Uh, dangling pointers, second one. This is quite common. Uh, and if you do this in C, well, um, in this case, I usually get errors because I have everything turned on. So I get uh, an actual error on this one. But uh, as I said, not everybody does this. If you try to return something that is actually allocated on the stack in this function and you try to assign to it, you, you're likely to get a segmentation fault, unless you're lucky. Uh, so this is quite common. Compiler warns now. So usually I get warnings for this and I don't make that mistake, or rather I make that mistake, but it doesn't go into production. So uh, if you do this in uh, Rust instead, this is not really possible in Rust. That, that's one of the things, because Rust don't have pointers in the same sense as C has. So I, I've taken some shortcuts here. And I am actually declaring a function that returns a reference to a, an integer that is placed in global memory. So that's what it means to be static in this case. But it errors out. So it's not identical to the program, but it's close enough at least. And you get an error here saying that, hey, you're trying to return something that actually is local here. And it will be destroyed here, so not allowed. Questions? Have you made this mis mistake any time? Me too. And I still do it, so. <coughs> Use of the free. This is uh, a quite common problem. And I, I've run into this in, in very strange ways occasionally. I mean, this is a very easy example. Sometimes you have these double deletes happening or you have a use after, after a delete actually accidentally because you didn't think about the destructor running or something like that. That can happen. Uh, the previous examples generated a warning. I tried to get this to generate warnings. It didn't. I tried to turn on as many uh, flags I could in GCC and I couldn't actually get it to generate a warning of any sort. So it pauses and it actually works when you run it most of the time, but not every time. Did you try the C++ or the C? Uh, this one. They have something in the C which contracts the memory allocations, but not in C++. Okay. There are a number. You have, were you thinking about ASAN or something like that? No, they just introduced some warnings which can uh, do some kind of memory. Okay. Probably taken from Rust, actually. So I, I've seen some, some uh, cross-pollination uh, between C++ and Rust, actually. So they are introducing things from each other's. Yeah, but they enabled us more in front of C, so it's not for C++. Okay. Hmm. I wonder why, actually. Um, so th this is actually a case where, and I can't write a program in Rust for this. It, it, it's not possible. So, I mean, I can't do this because there is no such thing as an explicit delete. The only chance you have is run this with uh, sanitizer builds. Yeah. So if you use ASAN or something like that, you will, you will discover it. Another thing that actually is quite common, this is uh, a, a, an easy example. You can test this at home. So uh, iterators, you, if you use iterators on a vector, that's fine. You create a vector, you push something back on it. Then you take a, uh, a reference to the first one. You take an iterator pointing to the first element, keep that around. You need to do something with it. And then you push back another element. Everything should be fine, right? No, push back can actually invalidate the iterator, but it doesn't have to. So your test might run fine, but when you suddenly start to actually deploy this, you will have nice random crashes. And the problem here is that at this step, here you take the iterator, but once you push something back, the vector might be too sw small for this memory. So it has to reallocate a new chunk and move it somewhere else. But this pointer still points to the original memory, which is released. And then 
this attempt will point to memory that doesn't exist or isn't allocated I should say it still exists of course <coughs> doing something like this in Rust on the other hand actually generates an error so you have the same semantics for vectors in Rust as you have in C++ there is no difference if it grows too large you move it actually but it complains and it says uh, hey you're pushing something here and now you're taking immutable but this is not allowed because it could potentially move I don't know for sure uh, because it doesn't look ahead but it says that at this point you are taking a reference to something that could potentially move so you need to be careful and it actually generates an error because it can, can s later di discover that this will actually create problems so for us this fails it doesn't compile but only if you push the second uh, yes no not necessarily if you do something in between that could potentially change it it could fail but if you don't do this push it will actually uh, work fine <coughs> It will not so give an error. So, so the error is in the print line, then it's not in the... No, the error is sort in of. the second push line. Yeah, sort of. Uh, if the element is not used, then it still gr gives an error because you have a reference to something that could be used. So it actually generates an error anyway. It could say that this is defined but not used, so I could ignore this error, but it doesn't at this point. So this is an, another example of where it tries to do this, tries to avoid the, these kinds of problems. Sorry, and I yeah, the error, uh, what's the error here uh, above let? Yeah, what's that? That error? Yeah, what exactly would it say? Oh, I had it actually here below, but I uh, removed it. Uh, it not says the exact words, but it says something like, oh, you're you're violating ownership rules." I think it says something about the count or of the proof of mutable and. There you have the ownership rule. Yeah. Like yeah, okay. something like that. Yeah, something like that. Now you can't say that force is both as like shared and as mutable. Yeah. Okay, and what gives that error was our big the push is there or not? It's uh, because we have both the yeah. print line and the second push. So this the one is called. of those two yeah. means yeah. that it tries to access the same variable in two ways. Yeah. And so the this one. Between those three lines, yeah. Those yeah. Yes. So this is called a borrow. It borrows a reference to a position. So it says, I, "Hey, I want to borrow this because I might want to read uh, this one." And then later you so actually. If I put either push or print line, if yeah. I use just one of those uh, lines, the compiler will see that I'm only using one of the references yeah. I'm making, and it will be okay. Yeah. But the thing is, I'm using trying to use both references. Uh, You're trying the, to use it in two different ways. And the element. Yeah. Yeah, you're trying to use it in two different ways. Here uh -huh. you want to read it, and that is a borrow. But you can only have uh, one mutable borrow and any number of uh, immutable borrows. And this is an immutable borrow. But once you start to actually take a mutable borrow, which means I want to change this, it says, hey, you're trying to get a mutable borrow, but this one says you already want to read it, so that's not allowed, forbidden. And if you change the order, then you're also good. So uh, yes, you should be good. I remove one line of the, uh, of the, two, of the last two lines. Yep. I remove either one line of them, I, I don't get smiled. That's true. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'll cover the rules later. So I'll give you concrete examples. This is more focused on giving examples of, of how, it, uh, how it actually behaves in comparison to C++. So... Rust's way to address this is no implicit conversions. That's one of the rules. Uh, some safe exceptions exist. You can, if, if it's safe, it, it allows certain cases. Uh, no unsafe pointers. You have a uh, way to get out of this checking by calling, calling unsafe code. Uh, we are not considering unsafe code here. Can you do that with anything? Unsafe code. Yeah. Maybe Basically. Anything basically so unsafe code also have pointers so you can actually manipulate c, c pointers it's intended mostly for interfacing with c or other libraries uh, but that means it doesn't have any null pointers either so de by default rust doesn't have null pointers it doesn't exist uh, no explicit deallocations you can't delete something you can't explicitly deallocate it it's not entirely true as uh, you will discover if you dig into it, but 
basically you can't have explicit deallocations. But there is no garbage collector. And the key to this is the ownership mm. semantics. So it has a number of rules saying how you can borrow and reference stuff so that you don't have race condition. That's the key point. And that's how it tries to solve this. Normally, when you move things around, when you pass variables to functions, you use move semantics. So you move things into a function and it stays there. If you want to do pass it back, you move it out again. You can copy, and copy means bitwise copy. You can also clone, which means do whatever you like. Uh, but by default, you have very strict ownership semantics. If you clone something, of course, you can pass that on to somebody else. Yes? Do I understand it correctly that it's kind of a compile time reference counting? Yes, yeah. kind of. It's not actually a reference counting, but it's, it has a very set of strict rules that sort of is more strict than necessary but it doesn't have to use reference counting. I'll come to them, so. And then you have this concept of immutable and mutable borrows, and a very annoying uh, borrow checker. If you go into Stack Overflow, you will see my um, complaints about things that I couldn't make work. And this is basically the borrow checker complaining about stuff, and I have no clue what's going on. So I'm trying to ask on Stack Overflow, and people say, hey, it's obvious, or sometimes they say, that's interesting, I didn't realize that was a problem. So, well, if you want to have fun, you can go look there. So, Now we're going to go and introduce a little Rust and try to, to discuss the, the basics of Rust. This is quite a lot, so it's more slides than necessary. Uh, and I don't think I can cover everything, so I'll probably cut short. But the slide will make the slides available somewhere, so you can look at them later if you want. Uh, here's a starting example, just to get the basics of Rust. So you declare functions with fn, here's the dot product, you have a for loop, you see the range there. You have a range operator, you can create a range going from zero to the length of something. You can do some indexing onto arrays, here you have two vectors that you pass in. Vectors consist of floats. And then I can create two vectors and I can just do a dot product of them and print the result. So. Uh, I'll give you a chance to ask questions here if there's something that you think is odd. I'll explain more so. Yeah? Not odd, but what is if the, if, if the second array of the vector has less elements? Does it panic and exit or does it switch? Well, in this ca case I actually go through the number of elements in the first one. But yes. here's a case where it actually can panic. If you ta try so to reference a vector... Panic. Sorry? This would run time panic. If yes, it would run time panic. Elements, it would run time panic if the later vector is shorter. So you should have some error checking here. Yep? Is the type of result inferred directly or is it because, uh, yeah, it's just 0.0, 0 which is 64 by default? Sorry, I didn't it's get that. Result inferred by the return type or by yeah, the there is, yeah. constant? The return so type is? Result. So the, the variable result, the type of result the is yeah. inferred yeah. from the type of the function? Yeah, or? it's inferred. So okay. er, it, er, there is type inference inside Rust, and that's actually very powerful. Okay. So you can give a type. I did that in the previous example. We do not have to usually. Okay. So it figures it out itself. It actually looks ahead in the program as well. Okay. Yeah? Uh, this is making copies of the arrays, isn't it? No, it moves them. It moves them? Yeah. So it moves them into... So when you pass it in here, if you were to do something afterwards, I'll show you an example, it, they wouldn't exist. So uh, when you said like no explicit deallocations, uh, that doesn't include like a, a drop function where you, you pass your variable to that and then You can actually drop it, but that's a sp is very rare and special case. Normally you actually drop them automatically. If I print the X after this print line, I get an error. Uh, you get a compiler, yes, compiler, because yeah. yeah, because X doesn't exist after that. It's passed into the function, it, it belongs to the function, you can't read it. Yeah? So if I understood correctly, you said that uh, it's going to bounce check the Y, you know, square bracket I every single iteration, right? It will do that, yes. But it will panic if it, it overflows. So what if I'm really interested in performance and I don't want to actually bounce check every time? Is then there any other type other than vector which does not offer then bounce you, checking? Then you invoke unsafe code and you use pointers. And you can do that. 
So, but uh, that's unsafe code. I think it's worth pointing out that the compiler can probably tell and just do one bunch before, like hoist the bunch out of the loop in this case. But it's very efficient, the, the optimizer. It's very good at figuring things out. Hmm? The question is going to panic then. Sorry? The question is going to panic. Yeah. Because I'm not a specialist in Rust, but in C++ I would expect panic at a certain point, like how yeah. the result is computed, and then panic. If it, you move yeah. the check outside the loop, then yeah. you kind of panic before. I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think it knows there will be no side effects. So it can just panic, move the, move the panic. I'm not sure the I'm compiler sure is panic the compiler, consistent. I it sounds it strange. Be. In this May case. Keep the panics in good place. Make sure to panic when you should panic. <laughs> I wonder if that is a good optimization. Anyway, yeah. Um, so um, there are a few things that Rust has that doesn't exist, and which are I think is actually quite cool. Enumerations, for instance, it's not like C++ en enumerations or C enumerations. It's more similar to Haskell uh, data types, actually. So you have an enumeration, which is a constant, but you can have parameters to it as well. This is really cool when you build an interpreter, for example, and want to have uh, various uh, clauses with add, mul, div, whatever. So it's actually quite useful. Uh, in C++, you would use something like enum plus a struct plus union, perhaps, or you could use a clause and have a hierarchy of them. That, that would work as well. But this is quite easy to use and quite cool, actually, in my mind. Uh, here's an example of using a, uh, enumerations. It actually has pattern matching. So if you have something of type error, the previous one you saw, you can actually match it. And then you can say, if I got an aborted, I do something. In this case, I, I return the string aborted. If it was not found, then I can actually take that parameter k and build a string from it and return that. So it's actually quite convenient to use when you build systems. I, I like this kind of model of working. So it's a variant. Sorry? It's a variant. Yes, variant. it's a variant. That's entirely correct. And that's from Haskell originally, actually. So you see they steal from each other, all of them. Uh, so you, you usually only include uh, other things uh, when you need them, like that? Use, error? Sorry? To, to use error, you do it inside a function instead of uh, on top, like in uh, C and C++. Yeah, you can you do that. You should do it locally, locally like that when you can. You can do that if you want to. So it, it has local variables in the same sense. Here's something that is built in. Uh, this is an enum. It is an option. So this is how it avoids actually using a null pointer. So it has something called an option. And this exists in C++ as well, std option, and optional, I think it's called, right? Somebody's good at C++ here, so it's optional, right? And it has either some value or it has no value. So this is how you use, instead of having a null pointer, you have options. But it takes a type as well. So it has a type parameter. So you can accept anything. It can be an option of int, it can be, it can be an option of u size in this example I have below, or anything else. So it has sort of templates. You also have template functions. So you can have an index function that can work for any type T. So you can have template uh, generic functions for uh, as well as generic types. And this is just an example. Here you have a function taking a, having a type parameter, taking a vector of something and returns whatever that is. It could be an index if it wants to return an index, a position where it's found, for, ex for example. And here you see a special type called the reference type. So this is what Rust has instead of references. I'll cover this in just a few slides. Another uh, type that is built in and also has special support is the result type. So you have no exceptions at all. There is nothing like that. You actually have result types instead, which is a way to say you either return a correct result, that is an okay result, or you return an error. And they have different types. Uh, this is 
coming from more or less Haskell as well. It's called a mona up there, where you can return either an actual value or a, an error, something that aborts. Uh, and this is an example. So in this case we have a function that takes a file name and a pattern. It actually takes uh, two strings, or references to strings. One is a pattern, one is a file name, and it returns uh, essentially all lines matching that pattern. And in this case I open the file, I read the files, and then I, I look and see if I can find a substring containing that pattern. And if so, I push it, and then I return everything at the end. One thing that Rust does is it doesn't require a re return. The last value in the function is actually the return value, so you can skip the return. But return exists if you want to return early. Yes? The line that says let line equals read question mark. So yes. that means that read might fail. What, what is read doing exactly there? Yes, I'll, that is actually the result type in effect. So what happens is when you iterate the file lines, you are going through, you are creating an iterator, and the iterator returns a result each time. The result can either be a line or uh, an error. And the question mark operator basically does this. It says, if it was an okay result, take that and give it back. If it was an error, return the error upwards. So this is a shorthand for actually being able to take the line and process the errors. You can chain this quite, quite heavily, it can become very unreadable, but this is how you handle the results. So it's an implicit return there, returning case of error, essentially. And otherwise it's just get the value. More questions? Then, how does it work over the stack? I mean, now this function can return an error. Yep. Do the functions above then also have to consider that they can get either a result yep. or an error? They can get a result. The result can be an okay value or an error. But yeah. yes, but they have to consider does that. Does it infer it from the content of the function? Or? Uh, the calling function, it infers it, yes. So everything so, so is type safe. So the calling safe. function knows, like the compiler knows about all the contents of the functions? Yes. And if I call now no, the just the types. Just the... It doesn't infer return types, or it does for lambdas, but not for functions. You see the explicit result type yeah. for it. It's and given here. Our result can have error as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. result okay. can be two so things. You can use the question mark, otherwise you couldn't use the question mark. Yes. Correct. Ah, okay. So you have to have a result type, return type, to use the question mark operator. Yep. Of those two types that you have named okay and error, Yep. How does it know which one is the error? I mean, ERR is just a name that you've chosen. So which one is next to the question mark? Or is that part of the language? This, this is built in. So the question mark expands to a match clause that matches either OK and then return the actual value inside it, or uh, executes a return with the error. So this specific type, enum result, is part of the language? This one, yes. Yes, okay. the question mark support is hard coded for the option and the percent type. Yes. Okay, thank you. Hmm? So this question mark on the left line equal read yep. uh, line, mm -hmm. the code, you just then error out if there is a line, so it doesn't take into account the previous defined results in the vector, right? Or? Sorry, say again, I didn't so follow. So assume we have five lines, in the four first three lines we got the pattern, but yep. on the fourth line we had an error. Yeah. So then it returns the error, but not the previous found patterns. I'm just mm. trying to understand what the yeah. code is doing. So it's a return error then. The yeah. OK result will not will be just lost, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Because it saves everything in a vector. Yeah. And it here it will return here if it, it's, it's an like error. It's like an early exit because yeah. of the, as if it's coded as return something. Yes. On that specific line. That's yes, it. Like exactly. It, it expands to return. Pardon? Or as if you had thrown yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it, 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 re, it uh, expands to a, an actual return statement. Yes? What is E? E? Uh, it's an E type. So you have two types, T and E. T is Where the type, is E is the error type. The example. Sorry? Where it is in the example. Ah, sorry. Um, I haven't added it. It's quite common to actually redefine the result type in the package, so you have a default error for the package. And I fi missed it there, so I should actually have it there as one. Well. But then it should be compatible with what's open and new and other things you thought, right? 
it should be compatible with whatever is expected in the caller, yes. I guess it's uh, IOR uh, that should be done here. It could be, yes. Yes, it's probably STD colon colon IO colon colon result. Yes, exactly. So this one is actually a specific it's result just type. Yes, which, so, which uh, sets what the error type is. Yep. But if you want to have more than one error, like you have an IO error and you have a, some other error, for example, if you don't have results, you want to return some not found error. Then you create an enum with one uh, tag IO error, one tag division error, one tag whatever. So it's like a nested part from my chain. You could do that, yes. yes. And the ergonomics of that are not that great. That's no. not the bad thing about that. Yeah, it's very hard to maintain. I've tried various strategies. I have something that I think work pretty well by defining actually defining the error type and the result in the package that uses it. But it's cumbersome in some cases. So because it's not uh, an easy topic in any language. Yes, correct. But the, the good thing here is actually this is explicit. I think I find C++ exceptions quite hard to work around. Uh, there are all these examples where you say, okay, here's a function, how many exit points do you have? And then you have to remember where every place can throw an exception. And that's not easy to follow. Here it's quite clear. Ownership and borrowing. borrowing. Yes, this is the central part of, of uh, uh, Rust, essentially. So it has a number of concepts around ownership and checking. I don't know what the time is. Just take it down. Okay. Uh, so I, I'll cover ownership and borrowing, and then if we'll, we can check checkpoint and see if you want to see more or not. Uh, this is central to Rust. So it's checked at compile time. You don't have a garbage collector. If you have a program that runs the risk of actually losing data, it will actually error out at compile time, except in some cases. There are always exceptions. Uh, arrays out of uh, indexing outside or an array is an, is an example. Uh, this is actually quite a good thing. If you review some piece of code, if I review C code, I have to think about, is this a null pointer? Can it potentially have a segmentation fault? Have you uh, released every memory you actually allocated, etc.? I don't have to care about that. I only have to care about the logic of the program when I review Rust. That's actually quite convenient. Uh, if it compiles, there are basically never any memory issues. You don't have to bother about that. You can look at the logic of the program. Uh, so this is quite convenient in my mind. So ownership. Every value has a single owner. Uh, when the owner goes out of scope, when the function stops executing or something basically, then the value is dropped. So you, you delete it at this, that point. It works like uh, in C++, no surprises there. Ownership can be transferred. You can move things between functions. Here's an example. So we have a function called show. It, what it does is actually it prints out a dimension. I have a type dimension containing a width and a height, and it accepts it as a uh, parameter, and then you call it here and you transfer ownership. So you create the dimension here, you pass it in, and it is moved in. If you try to do something here, it doesn't work. It generates an error. Of course, you have, you're trying to access something that you don't own anymore. This is, of course, not always as useful. So in some cases, you actually want to do something. This show function, for instance, if you want to show uh, that I mentioned several times, you don't want to sort of recreate it every time you, you want to show it. So you need to have something else to actually work with this. And for this you have references. And references are similar to pointers, but not exactly the same. And I'll, there are some semantic differences. There are pointers as well, but they are considered unsafe. So pointers just contain an address. A reference is more like a temporary handle to something. Uh, when you are taking a reference, you are borrowing an access to it. So this is called a borrow. There are two types of borrows. There is a mutable borrow and it's an immutable borrow. So you can 
if you have an immutable borrow, you only want to, to read this uh, variable. If you have a mutable borrow, then you actually want to change something. Here you have two examples. So this is a immutable borrow, where you only want to show it. And here you have a mutable borrow, where you actually want to change the dimension. And you use it like this. You pass in, you create your data, you scale it. In this case, you take a mutable reference, and then you can show it as well. And you can call this any number of times, and it keeps track of that. Anything unclear? Any questions? I just wonder if, uh, what's the point of, uh, you could have just had that borrowing by default. So why do you have, why did they choose to have explicit, uh, like ampersand to say, move is default. Yeah, move is default, mm -hmm. but, but mm -hmm. I mean, what's the problem with having borrow by default if that's, because you usually think if, if, a, if like a read-only borrow is, is pretty low impact, it, it shouldn't affect the... Uh, because they usually, they, they decided to have move as default, so... But you, they could have allowed the function to define, like this function does a read-only yeah. borrow and don't have to put the ampersand, it's going to do that. Okay, yeah, they could have done that. They decided not to. I think they want to be very explicit about things. I think that's the key reason. But it's not en entirely true anymore because there are some subtle uh, costs happening in the language. So I'm not sure it actually holds valid anymore. But I think that was the original reason. Plus, you, I guess you have the lifetime things you will come to that is more... Yeah, but if, if you had a f this function, wh what I think his point is, is that if you had this function, it takes a reference, you have declared that it takes a reference. You don't need to add the data there if you have an implicit conversion to a uh, immutable borrow. You could have that in the language. They haven't, but you could have. Yeah, they could have, because they do implicit borrows when they call a method or an object. Yeah. So they mm -hmm. could yes, have it, because they have it in other contexts. Yeah, exactly. So they, they do. It does work in some cases. Yeah. Where does uh, object store and stack or on key? It differs actually. Um, I think I, I, I'm not fully up to date on the actual memory model, but it actually is both on stack and on heap, so it's not uh, entirely clear cut. So it, it is. Um, I, I would have to read up on it and actually have a separate presentation. But I guess that must be yeah. adjustable to, to be able to run without heap on another. Yes. So it, it does use stack for the, for most of it, but it's not for, that for simple. For the rest of the seven slides, please put the questions to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay. As far as I can tell, there, there's a bug, because you declare data as immutable, but then you get a mutable reference to it. But you can't do that, right? Data. Yeah, data. that's right. So, good catch. <laughs> yes. Well, the it is a bug. Right? Sorry? The compiler would catch it, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, it would. I don't, so I guess I haven't compiled this, so. <laughs> mm. uh, so, there are a number of rules for borrowing. So, and the idea is that the borrowing rules should be sufficient to prevent data races. And data races, they distinguish these from uh, normal races because you can actually have data races in single threaded programs. I've run into them. They usually happen when you have destructors running in different orders. And then you can have a race between different areas of the code that actually release memory in, in strange areas. I, I've run into it. It's hard to find. Uh, it rejects programs with dangling references, so you, you shouldn't be able to have that at all. And you shouldn't have to have a garbage collector. That's the key points of the rules. And they are, you have a single mutable, varo, uh, single mutable borrow of a value or you can have one or more immutable borrows of a value. And the lifetime of a borrow may not exceed the lifetime of the owner. So it keeps track of the lifetime of all the owners all the time. And these are the rules. So it's not strictly reference counting as you, you asked about, but it's close to that. Yeah? And I did understand it correctly that this is a compile time thing. It's this is a compile time thing. thing, not a runtime thing. Yeah. <coughs> so it, it deduces the lifetime and the borrows at compile time. So it doesn't actually need to have any reference counters? No. Nope. 
No, there, yeah, there are reference counted yeah. uh, objects as well, but they are used for linked list and complex graphs and similar things, but not, this is not what it covers. Mm. It's possible, yes. I'm, I'm unsure what you are, what case you are actually thinking about, but you can deduce it at at compile time. Yeah, yeah. And, and you are being conservative, so this is sort of, if it is possible that you could have a overlapping lifetime uh, or uh, it out out of lifetime, yeah, so then it's not okay. It's probably my intuition that's yeah. Right, so. so it, it you, doesn't really. You manually set the, the different uh, lifetimes for the variables, okay. different variables. So then it can uh, mm -hmm. match it. Okay. Yeah. Like lifetime like A and lifetime B. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so iterators is another topic now. I, I covered borrows and uh, uh, ownership basically. Uh, do you, should should I, I continue? I said please make the slides clear, but I would like to have further questions to the end because we are running out of time. There are people working, they want to go home, so. Okay. I have a few more slides, but let's take the questions at the end. So one thing that also exists in Rust is iterators. You're familiar with this from C++. No surprises there. You recognize most of it already. Here are two examples. Uh, it has a way to actually do functional-like programming. Uh, so it has extensive uh, support for iterators and closures. And here is an example. So you can use a for loop in this case. Uh, you're using a for loop for for actually iterating over a vector but you can actually do it more efficiently so you can also have this uh, functional version where you actually take the iterator of the vector and this allows you to iterate over everything and then you map for each element in the the vector you can actually map a function to it to do something in this case we add one and then the uh, in this case it's still lazy so it's sort of pending code to execute and then you terminate it with something that terminates it so it can be a sum it can be a collect in this case. Collect actually constructs an, a container of some sort. So this is an efficient way to actually iterate over a vector, add one to it, and then return a ve new vector with it. And this is thanks to anonymous functions, similar to lambdas, and also that you implicitly capture variables. So in this case, I actually haven't captured a variable, but you could have a variable inside here. It would be captured automatically. Sorry? Iterators have filters. The filter exists, yes. So it has a bunch of functions, too many to, to actually Everything memory. Everything functional, I'll find it in iterators. Sorry? Everything needed for functional, I'll find it in the iterators. Yes. For, uh, not only in iterators, but among other things in iterators. So you have uh, fold, you have map, you have uh, more efficient ways of map, re uh, map, uh, map reduce, actually. So you can sort of return a list of lists and flatten it. Uh, in one step, uh, you have a bunch of other functions. So uh, you can chain iterators. Yes. Hmm? Okay. Cool. You can chain iterators, and that's quite cool. You remember the dot product operator we had? It looked roughly like this. Um, I have re removed the return there, but it's this is how it looks roughly. You can actually write it like this. So you can sort of chain everything and stack everything up. And this, of course, becomes completely unreadable if you do it too heavily, but <laughs> it's very efficient. It's incredibly efficient compared to this one. So it's, it's a lot faster. Uh, I don't and you can see me asking about this on Stack Overflow as well. It's called zero overhead abstraction, I think. Yeah? So the second one then is safe right now because of the zip, I believe. Safe? Yeah, it's yeah, safe. If you get it's safe. Different lengths of vectors. Yes, it's safe. Okay. So it will just it will, ju it will minimum number of yes. Okay. So it will actually be, be correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the form function interface. I can't. I'm not going to discuss it too much. But you can interface C and C plus plus. It basi basically looks like this. You can declare a function and say that it should be exportable. Now you can call it from C. And you can actually uh, do something. Here is main is actually calling this one as, as an external function. You can go the other way around as well. So you can actually call C from Rust too. 
that is more involved, but it's doable. Um, here's a more complex example. Uh, and in this case, I'm actually calling a C function from Rust. Here you can see how it looks. So P write already exists. So I'm just saying that, hey, I want to use this function. It's an external C function. It exists somewhere, and then you have to link with the library, and it will work. And as you see, this is unsafe, so I have to say, hey, I want to do something that is actually unsafe. Please allow me, and don't complain. <coughs> this is quite useful when you want to transform. So Mozilla used this to rewrite a large code base. I don't remember what it was, actually, but they did it stepwise, so they worked from Sometimes from the bottom up, we're writing some basic functions in Rust. Sometimes the other way around, some pieces actually called C functions. And they managed to translate a very large code base stepwise by using the foreign function interface. Now, any questions? <laughs> yeah. it, yep. it looks like uh, it's a lot more fun to work with than C and C++. Yeah, I, I, I like it. I like it. I like it, yeah. It's a lot to learn, though. And as, as I said, uh, the borrow checker initially is um, very demanding to be diplomatic. But it's, it's also once you learn to use it to your advantage, it's, it's, uh, I, I actually like it a lot. And I have no problems with it anymore. But it took, it took a while. Would you bet for it in the future of systems? Yes, um, actually, this is one of the reasons. As I mentioned before, I actually learned a lot of different languages. Some of them fade out and, and are not that interested. I know Prolog, I know Scheme, I know Haskell, I know ML. Neither of these are actually living right now. Uh, this actually has potential to stay, I think, for several reasons. First of all, the governance. It's actually being actively maintain maintained continuously. The second one is that they are focusing on making it very sound and very easy to use all the time. So I actually think it has potential for being surviving into the future. But it seems like so far it's got more stuck into like uh, back end and, uh, and front end tooling instead of embedded like it was. Yes, this yes. Was yeah, I don't know the embedded, the embedded market, market is kind of strange. Nobody really discusses it too much. So people, my experience this is, uh, people write embedded systems, but they don't really talk too much about them. Sorry? They just want to use C. Yeah, yeah, most, most you see. Yeah. But there is, I think, this classic company for ESP32, they hired a Rust person. I guess it will be mostly, still, the basic tooling will still be probably written in C, but I guess there will be some board support package for that, that has some Rust idea. Possibly, yes. yeah. But there is a working group around embedded using using Rust for embedded systems. So I guess it's it's something that people uh, think about. Yes. So regarding uh, the uh, embedded stuff, uh, what's Rust take on allocators? Like I saw a lot of that exclamation mark and just putting elements in there. Mm -hmm. What allocators do you think? Does it assume there's a global allocator and does it always use that? Is there any way to get a reading allocation or any other specific I haven't investigated that. I, I would assume it is possible since it's focusing on embedded systems and you can link with libraries. So I, I would guess you can replace the allocator. I think they did that at one point, actually decided that the, the standard allocator wasn't good enough and they wanted something else. Just I, you just want yeah. in your function and like calling values. So yeah. They don't support that yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. The standard library mm -hmm. doesn't support it though. Mm -hmm. is, is there a problem if you're like importing some crates and all of a sudden you have yes. it's doing stuff like collect and all of a sudden boom you got huge memory allocations that in, you didn't want? Uh, not that I've experienced but yes it I think it's probably solvable. And they are thinking about solving it, but I'm not sure but I think it's pretty early stage. Mm. It is still evolving. So this is not a finished language by by any means at all. Also, there is still going to be a panic. There's no way to catch it. Yeah, it, it would have to be a panic, yes. Mm. What, what, what I saw, sorry, sorry, we are 15 minutes over time. <laughs> Further questions, please go there for the rest. We need to back slowly to get our stuff, and maybe you will turn up somewhere in a moment.
places yes. in the surrounding. Mm -hmm. Continue the discussion. As I would like to have it going on, but it's not, mm -hmm. not possible. But thanks, Bas. Also, have a